Andrew Huberman has been talking a lot about cold exposure lately. Cold exposure as a hormetic stressor to help with your circadian rhythm, to help out with free radical scavenging, all kinds of benefits. And I'm a fan of cold exposure. I just want to go into a little bit more depth. In this case, specifically surrounding autophagy. Okay, that is sort of the cellular recycling, which I'll explain in a little bit more detail with a fun analogy that makes some sense. Now, Andrew Huberman and I know each other to a certain degree. I like him a lot. I think we both like each other. We have some mutual friends in the special operations military world that I've done some work in, in terms of nutrition and stuff like that. But let's go ahead and break down this particular topic. And this isn't to defame him or anything like that. It's just to highlight other things that I want to go into more depth with. And if you want to see him on this channel, comment down below because we're working on it. Before I get into it, check out Thrive Market down below in the description. You can save 25% off your entire grocery order if you're trying to choose better for you options. What I mean by that is if you're health conscious and you're shopping for paleo or you're shopping for vegan or keto or you have a specific dietary pattern you follow, wouldn't it be cool if you could go to the grocery store and you could just go down a paleo aisle or go down a keto aisle? That's the way Thrive Market makes it. So that link down below saves you 25% off your entire grocery order. So stock up, plus you get a free gift when you utilize that. So use that link down below to check out Thrive Market and get your groceries delivered to your doorstep. Okay, where I wanna kinda connect some dots here. We know that cold exposure is good because it is a stressor. We know that cold exposure is good because it can allow what are called uncoupling proteins to form. Okay, more uncoupling proteins, basically they act like a radiator heater. And I've talked about this before, so please don't skip ahead because I'm gonna get to some good stuff, but just to phrase it really easily, imagine a college dorm room with a cruddy radiator heater. Okay, you plug that radiator heater in, the whole idea is inefficiency. You're taking electrical current and you're running it through a radiator heater that is dissipating that energy as heat. Well, uncoupling protein, specifically uncoupling protein one, not necessarily uncoupling protein two, but specifically it takes energy in your mitochondria and dissipates it as heat. Well, when you are exposed to cold, you increase the amount of uncoupling proteins. Why? Because it's a simple adaptation. It's an adaptation because the body says, oh, you're cold, let's find a way to create some inefficiencies that actually make you warmer. But how do we get there in the first place and how does autophagy come into play? Well, Dr. Andrew Huberman talks about autophagy quite a bit, but he talks more about hormetic stressors, things that stress our body and trigger an adaptation, which is where something called FOXO3 comes in. I like to call it FOXO3 just because I like foxes, my son likes foxes, and it's just kind of cool, so I call it FOXO3. But how does that come into play and what's this big picture? Well, first let's look at autophagy. Okay, autophagy is like a cellular recycling, okay? But I want you to imagine something. A cell is actually a really cramped space. So most of us, we've seen a cell in a textbook or something, and we see it like looks all pretty with the cytosol and the lysosome and all, and you know, it's beautiful, it's easy, and you can see everything. But no, in reality, it's not. It's ugly and cramped, it has a lot going on. And when you start having proteins and things like that that are building up in there, there's not room for them. There's simply not room for them. So autophagy is the prioritized degradation of these proteins and other organelles within a cell to ultimately consume them and use them as fuel to be able to make the cell more functional again. So if you had a big apartment building or a small apartment building with 30 people in it and then 20 more people came in, it would be really, really crowded. So if the 30 people can actually eat the 20 people, sounds weird, then those 20 people or 30 people are gonna be stronger and the cell's gonna still have room. That's kind of what autophagy is. But where does a stress response actually help with this? Because we know that fasting plays a role in autophagy, but candidly, caloric restriction just in general can induce autophagy just by way of AMPK phosphorylation. So we don't really know in the terms of fasting and caloric restriction, if it's a light switch, like we turn on autophagy and it's on, or if it's a dimmer and we can crank it up to 11. We don't really know. We can't really measure degrees of autophagy just yet, at least effectively enough to, to say confidently. Okay, but what we can see is that FOXO3 and that stress response actually induces autophagy. So FOXO3, is what is required for a stress response to actually trigger an adaptation. 
Okay, if we did not have FOXO3, FOXO3, we would not be able to adapt to a certain thing. So for example, caloric restriction, the adaptations that that signals just through nutrient deprivation, much of it is facilitated by FOXO3. FOXO3 is a transcription factor to allow genes to express, to express what we need to express to make changes. I think we all agree here that adaptation is a good thing. So if FOXO3 is sort of at the peak of that, then we would obviously want FOXO3 to be initiated. Well, there was a study that was published in the journal PLS1 Genetics that found that FOXO3 targets genes associated with autophagy. So when we induce the stress from cold exposure and induce FOXO3 or induce the transcription factor to act upon genes, it is targeting genes that are associated with autophagy. What this means is that when these genes are expressed, inside of a cell, it is encoding for vesicles to be formed that are going to be lower pH where autophagy can take place. It's called the autophagosome. This lower pH acidic environment allows for basically, let's just make it simple with the terminology, like dissolving of these proteins that can't survive in a low pH environment. So then they get consumed by the cell. So anytime we stress ourselves and we induce autophagy, this happens. Now when we fast, we know we induce autophagy. When we fast, we know that we increase FOXO3. Okay, we're seeing FOXO3 just associated with so many different things. So the whole cold exposure side is very interesting. And how does this potentially link with longevity? Because that's one of the things that Dr. Andrew Huberman has been bringing up is he's really linking a lot of these things and then you tie in Dr. David Sinclair and his work in terms of that. It's just very thought provoking. Well, there was an interesting meta-analysis study that took a look at 11 different studies with 5,000 people. They found that subjects that had gene mutations that triggered a higher level of FOXO3 ended up living longer. Now, correlation does not always equal causation, but this observational data is much more strong than random mechanistic data like I was talking about before. We know things work, yada yada, but that doesn't always add up to what we're looking for. So this kind of observational data really confirms a lot of the mechanistic research. What this means is that, not that you need to go have a gene mutation, but it means that whatever is going on at a DNA mutation level that is causing FOXO3 to be elevated is somehow in a wraparound way helping these people live longer in this study. So ways that we can induce stress and induce FOXO3 would be good. So that's where, although you still have to call it a hypothesis and speculation, the stress from cold exposure could be good. But one of the things that I think is important that needs to be said, and I think Andrew Huberman mentions it now and then, is we do have to be careful with too much stress, right? Perhaps you don't want to do cold exposure while fasting alongside a high endurance work. It, that would be a lot of stress, right? You can only handle so much neutralizing free radicals at a certain time. You can only express genes so much to be able to have a positive outcome. You can only have so much FOXO3 inducing changes, right? So just use it in moderation. And I know people on my channel really love pragmatic, tactical things. So I usually say, treat your cold exposure as a workout. Okay, do it on your recovery days, even though it's not really recovery. Don't do it alongside a hard workout because A, it's a lot of extra stress, but B, you can also attenuate the inflammatory response from the workout that you need in the first place. You need those monocytes, you need those white blood cells, you need that inflammatory response temporarily after a workout to be able to deal with it and move into the next phase of regeneration and rejuvenation for your cells. So anyhow, three days a week on your non-workout days. So as always, keep it locked in here on my channel, and I'll see you tomorrow.